Welcome back to Intro to Philosophy 1010. This video is on Lucretius's, uh, the chapter by Lucretius on the nature of things. So the previous video was the Tao Te Ching, and before that was Plato's Republic, the cave allegory. Now, Lucretius is the opposite of Plato. Lucretius is an atomist. He thinks everything is made out of little bits of matter. They have no soul. And these, there's an infinite number of these little bits of matter, and they exist in an infinite void for an infinite amount of time. And all of the order in the universe that we perceive is a result of random combinations of these little bits of matter over the enormous expanse of time, an enormous expanse of time. So that's uh, it's a pretty straightforward reading. So I will um, get right into these discussion questions on page 189. Number one, the view you find in Lucretius seems to imply that the universe is explainable. This goes against the Taoist view that you cannot talk about it. Which view makes more sense to you? Why explain? So there's no wrong answer as far as which view makes more sense to you. I'm just grading on your knowledge of the text. So if you say Lucretius's view makes more sense to me, um, that's fine, but I want to be able to tell by your answer what is Lucretius's view. Um, and also, you can say, well, Lucretius's view makes more sense to me because it's just simpler and, and it's more straightforward, whereas the Taoist view is filled with metaphors um, that might not all of them might not make sense, but you might say I incline towards the Taoist view more. There's a bunch of different ways you could answer the question, and again, the main thing is knowledge of the text. As long as I know that you've read the text, that's what I'm looking for. So, let's see if I'll venture an answer here. Um, you know, the, Lucretius implies the universe is explainable. It goes against the Taoist view, which makes more sense. Well, Lucretius implies the universe is explainable because, for one thing, he reduces the universe to an infinite void, infinite amount of time, and little tiny bits of matter. So that's pretty explainable. Whereas the Taoist view of the Tao is this mysterious force that's the source of being. It reverts into itself at the farthest reaches of space. Um, we read from Bergson when he talked about, Henri Bergson talked about the difference between analysis and intuition. You can't describe something that's, so analysis is when you observe things from the outside and compare it using symbols to other things that it isn't. I use the example of the mouse here, this black mouse. Well, black describes this mouse. It also describes, you know, the cover of this book here. Um, it describes a lot of different things. So when you analyze something, you're comparing it to something that it isn't. So you're not describing anything that's unique about itself. If you were to describe something unique about anything, you wouldn't be able to describe that with symbolic language because then you'd be comparing it to something that it isn't. You have to get inside the thing, become the thing, have an intuition of the thing. And Bergson says, well, at least we know we can have an intuition of our very self. And similarly, the Tao is the source of everything. It's the supreme self. To have an intuition of it, you wouldn't be able to describe that with words. Lucretius doesn't believe in a self. He doesn't believe there's a soul that exists after the body dies. He just believes in this ongoing combination of atoms. So, which makes sense to me. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm more in line with the Taoist perspective um, because I do believe there is an underlying consciousness of existence that consciousness is not a byproduct of material atoms, so I'm inclined to find the Taoist perspective to make more sense uh, than Lucretius's materialism. Okay, discussion question two on page 189. Plato rejected the view of the ancient atomists based on the Plato selections you have read. 
why might he have done this explained? So we've read the Phaedo by Plato and the Cave Allegory in the Republic. So based on those two readings, why do you think Plato rejected the view of the ancient atomists? So in the beginning of this reading by Lucretius, um, he mentions his Greek guide, and the, it was Democritus, Democritus. Um, I think it's, it's the pronunciation is Democritus is the closer to the way they would have said it in Greece at the time. I'll just read here. So Plato rejected Democritus. Democritus was writing before Plato, and Plato rejected that whole philosophy that Lucretius is recounting. Um, but I'll, I'll read a few sections when he talks about how Democritus freed people from the oppressive weight of religious superstition. On page 179, the second paragraph, he says, When human life to view lay foully prostrate upon earth, crushed down under the weight of religion, who showed her head from the quarters of heaven with hideous aspect lowering upon mortals. A man of Greece ventured first to lift up his mortal eyes to her face and first to withstand her to her face. So that sentence seemed to be awkwardly constructed, but a man of Greece was the first to stare back at religion, which was staring down at, from heaven with a horrifying face. Um, and then on page 180, the last sentence of that paragraph at the top there. Therefore, religion is put underfoot and trampled upon in turn. Us, his victory brings level with heaven. So rather than be terrified by the gods, Democritus looked for physical causes of things and thereby freed people from the oppressive superstitions of religion. This is what Lucretius is saying. Um, so... I'll read, continuing on page 180, the next paragraph down, he says, This terror, then, and darkness of mind must be dispelled, not by the rays of the sun and glittering shafts of day, but by the aspect and the law of nature, the warp of whose design we shall begin with this first principle. Nothing is ever gotten out of nothing by divine power. So here's the beginning of his atomism. Of his atomism. Nothing is created. The only things that exist are these little tiny bodies, these little atoms of matter, these seeds, as he calls them. There's a fixed number of seeds. There's an infinite number of seeds, but there's a fixed number of different kinds of seeds. And this infinite number of finite types of seeds combine in an infinite void over an infinite amount of time and create all of the things we see. These little bits of matter cannot be created and they cannot be destroyed. They are the tiniest, simplest, uh, what he calls solid singleness on the top of page 186. First beginnings therefore are strong and solid singleness. So they're not like Plato talked about, things that are compound of compounds of different other things are capable of being disintegrated. So a soul, he says, or the eternal ideas are simple. They're not compounded of anything. So the closest to that kind of solid singleness that Lucretius can get is these little bits of matter. Although they are extended in space, they're too small for us to see, he says. So they're material things that can't be seen. So that's not quite in alignment with the empiricist philosophy, which says if you can't observe it, is just a figment of your imagination. On page 183, Lucretia says that bottom paragraph, and nature then, as it exists by itself, is founded on two things. There are bodies and there is void in which these bodies are placed and through which they move about. All right, so, um, so there's his basic philosophy. Going back to discussion question two, why would Plato have rejected this philosophy? Well, for one thing, Plato believed the universe is rationally ordered to be the best it can possibly be by the ultimate idea of the good, which is the source of reason and the source of the material world. Whereas for Lucretius, on page 187, about the middle of the paragraph, he says, For verily not by design did the first beginnings of things station themselves, each in its right place, guided by keen intelligence, 
Nor did they bargain sooth to say what motions each should assume, but because many in number and shifting about in many ways throughout the universe, they are driven and tormented by blows during infinite time past. And that's what creates all the order in the universe. So clearly, Plato re rejected. Plato believed the idea of the good organizes everything to be the best it can possibly be. Whereas that's the opposite of the um, atomists. And also the atomists are, they don't believe in God. So Plato, even though Socrates was executed for believing in gods of his own invention instead of the gods of the state, he still believed in these divine, you know, the, he believed in the demigods and the ultimate idea of the good, which is equivalent to this a supreme god. So there's another reason why Plato would reject the ancient atomists. Lucretius came after Plato, but Democritus came before, and that's what Plato rejected. Also, Plato believes in the soul, so he believes in, a, in reincarnation, none of which is believed in by the atomists. So discussion question three on page 189, explain Lucretius's argument for the position that all there is consists of atoms and void. Well, uh, his argument for that, he just states it as a, as a fact, but the reason the void must be infinite and there must be an infinite number of atoms in an infinite amount of time, he gives reasons for that. He says if the void was finite, then eventually all of the atoms, and if there was a finite number of atoms and a finite void, all of the atoms would have collected in the lowest point of the universe. Um, if there was a finite number of atoms but an infinite void, there'd be no tangible objects because the atoms would be so vastly dispersed, no, no empirically observable physical objects could be formed. If there was an infinite number of atoms in a finite space, you couldn't move around because things would be so tightly packed. So therefore, using reason, you can, you can figure out that there is an infinite void an infinite number of these little bits of matter and an infinite amount of time through which that they've, uh, they've been combining in random ways. Okay, so that is all she wrote for Lucretius, a very straightforward philosophy. It's pretty much the predominant worldview in a lot of uh, the academic world. I don't think it should be. It's his idea of these little bits of matter are, are a lot like Sir Isaac Newton's idea of little bits of matter. That idea was overthrown in the 20th century, as I've gone over before. So if there aren't little bits of matter that exist in an objectively real way, whether you're looking at them or not, um, then this philosophy falls apart. And according to quantum physics, particles are there as particles when you observe them. They behave as waves of probability for where a particle might appear were to be observed when you are not directly observing them. As, as revealed by the two-slit experiment that I went over. General relativity says that there's a space-time continuum. All points of space and all points of time coexist in a block-type universe. And furthermore, everything originates, according to general relativity, from a, a point of infinite density, the singularity. So there was a beginning, at least to this universe, which is something Lucretius would reject. And furthermore, that singularity is not physical. So the tiniest things that exist in solid singleness from the current cosmology would be the singularity, but that's not a physical thing. It has zero extension in space. You cannot see it. It's the source of space and time. Um, so, it, so I'll leave that where it is. The next reading is by Leibniz. It's called The Monadology, and that's a lot more similar to 20th century physics on now into the 21st century. And it is the most complicated reading we've had so far, possibly the most complicated reading in the book, next to maybe Immanuel Kant, whom we'll discuss in the next part of the book. So the next video will be The Monadology by Leibniz.